Hey guys, thanks for watching our video highlight of our trip to Santa Cruz for the Legends in Luthier project with Rick Turner of Rick Turner Guitars and Richard Hoover of Santa Cruz Guitar Company. This is part two in the video series, and this the next five videos will be more of an extended play of some of the longer content that we got while we were up in Santa Cruz. So in this next video, we have an extended interview with both Rick and Richard where they're at the Santa Cruz Guitar Shop. So why don't we check that out right now and look forward to seeing you in the next video. Hey guys, how are you today? This is Brendan from Heartbreaker Guitars Las Vegas and I am in Santa Cruz, California with two <laughs> legends in Luthery, Mr. Rick Turner and Richard Hoover. Guys, good morning. <laughs> yeah. How are you? Good day. <laughs> yeah, we're in Santa Cruz too. It's a good day. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> today we are discussing the Legends in Luthery project, which, uh, well, I won't discuss it. I'm going to turn over to you guys and uh, tell us what this project is, how it began, the genesis, and uh, what, what it is. Uh, you know, my association with Rick goes back a really long ways. Uh, being luthiers in the earlier days uh, was, was pretty isolated. And uh, so we had a, the people that are a pretty tight community. And uh, um, Rick and I have uh, collaborated, talked a lot, but we've never done anything together. And this is a really unique uh, situation and a beautiful opportunity for us to work together on a project. Uh, we're building our specialties, our individual guitars, uh, but with similar wood with a great story, or exactly the same woods with a great story, and uh, uh, amplify you know, what we do, our values, our philosophy. Uh, it's really moving to, to work with woods that are, are precious, uh, uh, we might never see in the future, and to um, have amplified that through you and uh, the reputation of your store and what you do. So I'm grateful to be in on this, and I'm happy to work with this guy. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting project, not only because we're old friends, but because it's probably the first time the two guitar companies have worked together on a project like That's this. Funny. That's funny. You know, you think of guitar companies as being competitors or whatever. Well, what Richard makes and what we make are very, very different. So there's none of that kind of product against product competition. But you still, you know, we have our individual companies and we love to get together at trade shows or have dinner or whatever. But I think this is the first time that two guitar companies have worked together like this to make matching instruments, so to speak, with matching woods and appointments and inlays, and <clears throat> and get together and make these pairs of guitars. Um, I think you suggested it. I recall a dinner about seven, six, seven years ago that we were at, yeah. at the NAMM show, and we, you and I were already doing special limited edition the projects. The limited edition stuff, yeah. Yeah, and then I think it was you that, uh, when, I, when I thought of the idea of building it with, with a great acoustic builder, yeah. uh, I think it was you that mentioned <coughs> Richard, and at the time, what a guy. Yeah. <laughs> at the time, we weren't even a Santa Cruz Guitar Company dealer. So I love well, that. Well, even, thanks again. <laughs> right, well, I, I remember you asking me, you know, saying, what, what would it take to be a Santa Cruz dealer? I said, well, I'll put in the good word for you. And it, and it worked. <laughs> <laughs> for those out there that don't know the Model 1 guitar, could you just explain it a little bit, a little bit of the history? Well, the Model 1 guitar was really came about through discussions with Lindsey Buckingham <clears throat> while Fleetwood Mac was recording rumors. And I was working on Lindsey's guitars, his Strat and his Les Paul and John McVie was already playing Alembic basses at that time. And I got to know Lindsay and <clears throat> realized that he had the same kind of musical background that I did, starting in the folk scene, and then went to the dark side, went to play electric. And, uh, <laughs> and so his aesthetic was similar to mine, and we talked about what would make a great electric guitar for him. And it was something that had sustain, like a Les Paul, but would have the clarity of a Strat. And that would feel more like a fine acoustic guitar. And um, and I was still at Alembic at the time. This would have been 1978. 
and I drew up um, the Model 1 and showed the, uh, the blueprint to Lindsay, and he said, well, when you get one, I want to try it. Well, towards the end of 78, I left Alembic and took that design with me and uh, started up Turner Guitars in 1979, took the guitar down to Lindsay when they were in rehearsals for their Tusk tour, and um, put his, his roadie at the time, his guitar tech, Ray Lindsay, put the guitar up on the stage. We sat 150 feet away in this old sound stage, and eventually Lindsay came in, picked up the guitar on stage, started playing it, and he didn't put it down for three hours. And at one point during that time, and the band had come in, he, he yells back to Ray and he says, leave the Les Paul and the Strat and the Ovation at home. This is all I need. That's and, a testimonial. Yeah. And then uh, Mick came over and said, OK, we really like the way it works with the band. How fast can you have a, a backup? And that was the, you know, that was it. Da, 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 da. Yeah. We're off. And um, so Lindsay's gotten eight of them from me over the years, including a baritone. Um, and it just became sort of the flagship of, of our lineup. And now we're doing this, this version of it in conjunction with Richard. And... Um, and you're gonna have them pretty soon. And then Richard, tell us a little bit about the history of Santa Cruz Guitar Company. Okay, um, I'll, uh, I, I'll also tell you about the model we're doing for you too, if you wanna know the history of that. Um, uh, Santa Cruz Guitar Company, it, it, uh, you know, starting from the front is, um, uh, I wanted to make guitars. I was, I was uh, really, really motivated to do that, uh, yet there was no books. <laughs> no videos hadn't been invented yet. And uh, my progress was really painful in trying to look in other guitars and uh, uh, figure it out. The only thing available was the stuff on violin. And uh, that was, uh, uh, that's what I read, and that's where I uh, formed my assumptions for being a guitar builder on. And ironically, um, uh, it was a mistake because that's not how guitars are made. Uh, the violin, of course, is uh, uh, carefully assembled of, of parts that are either uh, uh, tuned or the assembly's in tune, so the instrument will have sustain and develop overtones, what everybody wants in a guitar. But the guitar doesn't need to be made that way. It, you can assemble a, a, a kit of pieces, and it's loud enough that marketing takes care of the rest for selling. So what I was actually doing is I was I was developing a niche in the market that that it wasn't being served, and that was the ability to make a guitar that you could guarantee the sound and also uh, manipulate it to do custom stuff. <laughs> Well, get together with some other people, and uh, uh, we'll make more guitars, be able to experiment, uh, accelerate our process, and that's where we are today. Um, and the intent was never to be the next Martin, but to be custom guitar builders. Right, right. And that's, uh, uh, we started that 43 and a half years ago. And here you are. Yeah, I was, I was, yeah. I was four years old at that time. Well, you know, one of the reasons <laughs> I, I find this project so exciting is uh, it's, it's really cool that you guys are old friends and you know each other um, and share that passion. No kidding. But <laughs> the, the, the guitars, I think they kind of go together because the Model 1, yeah, it's an electric guitar. It's a rock guitar made famous by these rock icons, but it's got these acoustic properties to it like you were discussing. Yeah. You know, and this is kind of an acoustic project. And uh, so the, it just works together. Well, the, the sonic aspects of the guitar, even a solid body guitar, are very important. The wood choices, the geometry of the instrument, the way the neck is put on, all these things affect what, what's going on with electric guitars is that the construction affects the way the strings vibrate, 
which is then picked up by the pickups. So there's this feedback loop in the guitar of the strings into the body, into the neck, and back into the strings, and that's what the pickups are picking up. So if you change any of that, it's going to change how the strings are reacting to what they're on. And uh, it's why if you put a pickup, uh, put a humbucking pickup on one of Richard's guitars, say for instance, mount it in the sound hall, it's gonna sound like one thing. I might thing. have an opinion about that. I, you should, <laughs> but, but you take that same pickup and put it on a solid body, it sounds different. So it's not about the pickup, which is what, that's a mistake that so many people in the electric guitar world get into. Oh, it's all about the pickup. It's not, because why does the same pickup sound different on one guitar and another? Because it's about the guitar. The pickup is just a window into the sound of the instrument. And you can have a big window, you can have a little window. You can have a tinted window, whatever, but you're just picking up the fundamental reaction of the strings to the body and the neck. Can we talk briefly about the wood selection and how that came to be and what it's gonna sound like? Uh, I'm gonna just, I'll give a brief thing about the uh, F model that we're building with you and why these woods work with it. Um, uh, uh, when we begin building, no, no person would play anything but a dreadnought because that's what the people on TV played. And it's and a dreadnought's overly bassy. Uh, it just it doesn't have the finesse. And the and our first F model was meant to be a finger style model. And so it was more evenly balanced. Uh, it was quicker in response. It had what you need for that. And that's that's uh, my choice in model for um, uh, working in your project. What the woods do, and this is this is. Uh, it shouldn't be controversial because it's physics, it's not an opinion. Um, what the wood contributes to the sound of the guitar is um, the, the scale of tone from uh, bright, clear, articulate uh, to warm, blended, uh, 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 accommodating. Um, when you play your guitar string uh, up over the sound hole near the end of the fingerboard, you have a warmer, rounder tone. You did? That's the best. You play that same string as you get closer and closer to the bridge, the tone gets brighter, brighter. Uh, the frequency stays the same, the volume stays the same, but the uh, but the tone changes. You know, uh, uh, tin bells, one being uh, silver and, and the last one being bronze, are going to ring at the same frequency, the same volume, but there can be difference in tone. That's what the woods do. They do not, in themselves, affect bass and treble, and people think they do because of that. Uh, bright to dark reference. So in a uh, um, uh, guitar where you, like uh, Eric Skye, want to be really articulate, have the audience hear every note you play and all the nuance you put into it, you want a, a, a tone wood that's bright, clear, and quick in response. So in the, the choice of this, of, of redwood, and I could say the same with cedar, is it's, um, it's a guitar, we, we, aside from the tone, it's, it's a really quick response. So when you um, are playing a finger style, you're putting less energy in the guitar than if you're playing with a flat pick. Um, oftentimes people are playing at open tunings, which have lowered strings, again, less energy, so less, less energy going into the instrument. And if the, if the instrument was the, um, uh, another combination of woods, that would diminish its volume. But with the redwood, like I said, it responds quicker with more volume to the same amount of energy. So it's ideal for that kind of playing. And that's the choice uh, I made in this uh, for the guitar for you, uh, along with a, a real versatile, real artist model, you know, a professional player's model. And uh, 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 we brace accordingly because we control the EQ more by the, uh, the bracing and the airspace than anything else. So uh, that's the story behind that. Mahogany uh, for sides and back because it's, uh, it's the most versatile. It'll please most of the people most of the time. Koa, walnut, and um, 
mahogany especially gets in the middle of that range so you can play more styles, mm -hmm. more versatile. So that's the idea of the combination of woods in the, in the F model we're doing for you is it's not, it's not compromised to be everything to everybody. Uh, it's meant to be a real precise instrument because if you want to exchange the, the bass, you could do that yourself. Okay, so Honduran mahogany back in size, and there's a special story behind this redwood top. What, oh yeah. What is it? Oh, I can tell that. <laughs> I'll let you go. Um, uh, we, we build out of responsibly harvested wood, period. There's no exceptions to that. And what I mean by responsibly harvested woods is the opposite of unresponsible, which would be deforestation, uh, uh, thoughtless practices where whole cultures can become extinct. Uh, when we use reclaimed wood, uh, it's the perfect uh, solution because we're not cutting a tree to get it, uh, we're, we're reclaiming from a previous source. The benefit of that is old wood sounds better than new wood. And there's no hocus pocus there. It, the main part of older guitars and violins sounding better than new ones is the, uh, the resins in the wood, uh, of course, are sticky. And in a wood that hadn't been dried, it's not going to sound very good. Uh, the, the vibration will be dampened. Um, you can bake the wood in an oven and uh, evaporate the moisture, but the sticky stuff is still there. Mm -hmm. And in a uh, factory building where people build for a price target, they can't go out and get old wood. They buy wood through uh, um, traditional sources. That wood's been stabilized and dry, but there's still uh, a viscosity to the resins that will only harden by uh, uh, polymerization and it's a chemical change that makes it more like crystal over time. So you give your guitar five, 10, 15, uh, 50 years, it's gonna sound a whole lot better than it did uh, when it was built. So we cheat and start with old wood. It's the Harden Road Bridge in Yosemite, and it was on the perimeter of the Rim Fire a few years ago. It's a fire that almost threatened the whole of the National Park, which is a, is a worldwide treasure. And um, it, uh, uh, it didn't burn the bridge, uh, but it got close enough, and being government work, they decided to replace the bridge, mm -hmm. you know. Concrete, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah right? And I don't know that it had any historical value, but to us it's priceless. It, uh, it was built probably late 1920s, um, and it is Sequoia gigantea, uh, not the Sequoia cypervirens that grows here in our environment. So it's, it's um, legendary, and we may not see this in a, in a generation or two. It might be gone. It's now illegal to harvest even fallen. That's right. Uh, the the gigantic redwoods. You know the, the the it's now if they fall they're supposed to rot where they lay and it takes about a thousand years That's to rot. That's the original idea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Rick, yeah. could you talk about how these woods are going to affect an electric guitar, specifically the Model One? Well, like I say, the 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 woods affect how the strings vibrate. How the strings vibrate is picked up by the pickup. Now, on the Model 1, on the ones that I'm doing in this series, we're doing the redwood cap top over a Honduras mahogany body. So in our case, the redwood is not going to have a super effect on the tone, but it will, it will affect it a little bit. For the necks, uh, because we normally make the Model 1s with a laminated neck, I chose to go with Honduras Mahogany, which would match what Richard is doing, but then laminate them with, um, with stripes of uh, black acacia, acacia melanoxylon, which came over from South Australia and Tasmania in the 1880s. It was brought over as an ornamental is that where our local yeah. stuff would come from? Yeah, yeah. And so this is some um, black acacia that came from uh, Felton, mm -hmm. uh, a big tree that I was given large chunks of, about 38 inches in diameter. They'd been quartered, and, um, and so I did the, the sawing on them. And, <clears throat> and what we did was, we, so I've got... I've got um, heartwood and sapwood to get the, the color variations for the center laminations in the neck. The laminated neck is interesting because it 
blends together the vibrational elements of the uh, of the different woods. So you're you're spreading apart the the resonances internally uh, with the woods by by putting diff woods of different uh, types, different densities together. You're you're blending. Uh, it's like a stew. I was just getting hungry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, and then you know with the ebony fingerboard. Uh, Ebony is an interesting wood because it it tends to not it it's very reflective of energy, so sustain is good. It tends to not overly superimpose its own sound on anything. Um, it's interesting because the um, ebony is very often chosen for steel string guitar bridges, whereas you go into the classical field, it's almost always rosewood. And because the rosewood is a little more resonant, and they're looking to, with classical guitars, they're always looking to get the brilliance happening. That's the, the most difficult thing. Whereas that's the sort of the last thing you need to enhance with steel string guitars. So you have these other interesting wood choices. I find ebony fingerboards to be a little more neutral than rosewood. Um, and there's another interesting thing, because in the electric guitar field, we are used to working with, probably with more different woods for fingerboards than the acoustic guitar makers are. You know, the classic being Fender, maple. I mean, what percentage of acoustic guitars are made with maple fingerboards? One percent, maybe, you know, so uh, none. <laughs> point, point oh oh one. Yeah, point oh oh one. Yeah, but it's very common with fenders, for instance. So you you do have these interesting things, and some of these wood choices are like the spices that you would use in a stew. There's a, yeah, there's no right or wrong. Yeah, and, and they're not the beef, and they're not the potatoes, right, right. but they are the, you know, parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme, you know. <laughs> My electric and Richard's acoustic are very compatible with the styles that we're building. And so the players that get these instruments are going to have an easy transition from acoustic to electric, and the shape of the body with our instruments is important because there are no parallel surfaces in the instrument. So the resonances are spread out and they're not, we don't have standing waves in the instrument. Uh, so we've got the warmth and sustain of the mahogany with a little bit of the redwood effect on the, for the top. And then the mahogany and black acacia necks, which are gonna be a little warmer than our maple and purple heart necks. We're making, in effect, a finger style electric guitar to go with Richard's finger style acoustic guitars. What a team. Yeah. Now you mentioned the redwood just kind of accents the tone a little bit. Is primarily the tone coming from that mahogany body? Primarily from the mahogany body and the neck. But it's just a piece of science and you can have good resonances and bad resonances. You know, the typical thing in luthery, you go to cellos, and the, the thing that cello makers and cello luthiers are constantly fighting is called the wolf. The wolf is an excessive resonance where a certain note will suddenly jump out. It'll be way louder than any other note on the thing. And so one of the big issues with cellos is fighting the wolf, controlling the wolf. But it also happens the opposite. I call it the coyote, which is the suck out of a note where the energy is going into an, a part of the instrument which is not acoustically significant, like the neck. Mm -hmm. Suddenly the neck is vibrating like mad, 
That's not doing you any good at all in the body or the string. It's sucking energy out of the string. And so these, so part of what we are doing is controlling resonances. Without them, the instrument is boring. With too much, you have an instrument, you know, and this is the issue with dreadnoughts, is that boom, which the bluegrass players love and recording engineers hate. And so what we're trying to do is manipulate those EQ points, if you will, and, and make these instruments be interesting but have controllable, even response. The uh, uh, common denominator here is this uh, beautiful uh, redwood, it's Sequoia Gigantea uh, from uh, Yosemite National Park. And this is extremely protected and uh, we won't see any of it coming out commercially uh, again. Um, uh, but it's not just the beautiful uh, provenance of the story, um, it's the quality of sound of this. So the source of it was uh, the Harden Road Bridge in Yosemite, uh, kind of on the perimeter of the rim fire a few years ago. So what, what we got is, the, is a support beam that was about 18 by 20 by about uh, 18 feet long. And this is a uh, 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 beautiful, dense, old growth wood. And what it's gonna give to the guitar is a really quick, clear, clean response. Perfect for somebody uh, using this as a professional tool to express themselves. Um, to support that, um, we're using a back and sides of uh, genuine mahogany. That's really, really old stuff as well. That's reclaimed. And uh, the density of that um, uh, gives it a, uh, a midpoint in the tonal range from a bright, clear, I mean, bright, clear articulate to dark, warm, uh, blended uh, sound. And we, we want it to be in the center to be versatile uh, for different styles of playing. Um, we use uh, 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 the genuine mahogany neck combined with an ebony fretboard because adding this weight to the neck is going to allow us to have the guitar project rather than to be big, open, and airy. Uh, for me as a singer-songwriter, open and airy is good, but for the player that wants to accentuate their playing, the projection is great. Uh, uh, the peg head is also adding a uh, mess to that. We have a ebony overlay on that and uh, uh, gears that carry a little bit more weight. So the rest of the materials in there uh, are supportive, but they're thinking about the tone as well. Uh, the, the bracing in that, uh, the glues that we use are all to give bright, clear sound with quick transmission. And uh, uh, there's, there's subsets to this, but that's the fundamental of it. And not only is it uh, really well thought out to give a, 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 again, a really articulate presentation with this guitar, uh, but anybody can feel really good about the source of the woods too. One of the things that's interesting here is that you've got the acoustic guitar builder here, the electric guitar builder here. We both agree firmly, wood matters. Okay, well, I think we're going to go on a tour of the shop, and then, Rick, later we're going to tour your Come shop on as my well. my place. And, uh, then get so yourself to the airport. Absolutely. Hey, thanks for watching, guys. And next on deck, we're going to do the extended bench interview where Rick and Richard are actually at the bench talking about the components of the guitars, the woods, and everything that is the Legends in Lou 3 guitars. <laughs> All right. Got a boom.